Thank you. Oh, that's nice. Thanks. Uh, so this is we're working on choreography here, clearly. So um, I'm going to I'm going to blitz through a, a series of slides and then um, Sharla and John and Lisa are going to just offer kind of comments about them. And then we want to have a conversation, which is why we've set this up this way. So we're going to see how that goes. We're going to really test the limits of what we can do here. Um, all right. What the heck is a third way? How do we hit advance? Hold on. I'm there. All right. I got it. Yeah, it's the Mac PC thing. So um, um, this is a concept that we've been looking to socialize. It's been part of a, a series of conversations that have been happening amongst just a few of us for a long time, and we're done talking to each other. We want to talk with with you. And um, uh, the idea here is that what am I doing wrong? No, no, oh, great. Is that um, it, the idea of third way comes from the notion that the first way is the traditional cost recovery way that um, particular university presses publish monographs, which is to spend a lot of money, $25,000, and then to try and do cost recovery, which is usually like half that amount. And so that way it doesn't work so well. And in, in the last 10 years, we've had a lot of very interesting open access um, pilots that have shown um, some really interesting usage activity, but they haven't scaled particularly well because they rely on a great deal of funding. You usually you need like a kind of a five figure amount for each book and no one really has that kind of money lying around. So that's the second way. It hasn't quite worked, although we like the results uh, when, it, when there's money. And so the concept is, is there a third way that um, is kind of a hybrid model that requires an embargo period? And I will say upfront that this idea is completely stolen from Brett Bobley at the National Endowment for the Humanities. They have this program for um, a fellowship uh, open book program where if they funded a fellow, um, they'll go to a university press after um, three to five years and say, will you make the book open? And they give the press $5,000. So completely stolen from, from them. Uh, but I liked it so much that now it's mine, ours. Okay, uh, this slide is probably too small for people to read. It basically says that everybody in our ecosystem is struggling. So that's uh, libraries, presses, authors, readers, and institutions. And um, you all know this to be true. So we're gonna skip over that. Um, so um, this seems to be a special moment. As I suggested, we've had about 10 years of um, some kind of testing with some open access uh, pilots. And so we've seen what happens when books are open, but we've also seen how hard it is and we're starting to understand how expensive it can be. Um, on the other hand, we did this uh, unforced experiment that if uh, people had come to us in normal times, uh, we would have said, no, you're crazy, we'll never do that. But during the summer of 2020, places like JSTOR and Project Muse and EBSCO and ProQuest came to presses and said, look, uh, the system broke down during COVID. Anybody with an IP address can't connect through VPNs and we already bought this book, but people can't access it. And they basically came to us and said, I know your sales really stink right now, but why don't you make all your books open for free? And we said, that doesn't sound great for us, but we're a mission-driven organization. And during times of crisis, you kind of have to lead with your values. So we said, okay, we'll do it. So a crazy thing happens, uh, which is usage goes through the roof. And John gave me a great slide that I'm gonna show with you in a second. Um, but, uh, but so we saw exponential use, and then we also saw um, book sales picked up too. And whether there's a causal thing there or not, uh, we don't quite know because book sales picked up whether the books were open or not. Um, but what we know is that opening the books didn't make books not sell um, during uh, the crazy summer of 2020. And then um, most of you are familiar, I'm sure, with the, the White House memo um, a couple months ago about opening um, government funded research. This probably looks is more important for STEM journal publishing than it is for humanities monographs publishing. But to me, it does suggest that there's a culture uh, growing about anything where the government's going to touch it, that it's probably going to be open. And also there's going to be lots of things that are open to read, which means it's going to be hard to find people who are going to pay you for things that aren't open. Okay, so John Lenahan uh, gave me the slide and this I want to just spend a minute on this slide. Um, because this is the pitch that I gave to Pooja and John to attend here, which is if you built a publishing program from scratch and you actually built ethics and DEI into your, um, your the DNA of your publishing program, you would not do the way that we currently publish books, which is put high price points and make it only available to people who um, have access to IPs at elite institutions like GW. And what happened during the summer of 2020 was to me, this was a transformational moment. It showed A, how bad usage was in the current model, and then B, how incredible it is in the second model. And I think if you started University Press today and you handed this slide to your provost, you would your provost would say, well, you should definitely publish everything open. Like, I don't think that would be like a complicated conversation. The problem is we have all these legacy institutions that are built for cost recovery, and it's really, you can't just pivot and, and flip like that. But I think this is super important. To me, one of the things this does is 
I've been in university press publishing for 10 years and there has been this kind of declension narrative all along about the, the monograph doesn't have relevance anymore. It doesn't sell, people don't read them. And it's all BS because what you saw is that it's the business model that's broken. Once you open them, they get used in crazy numbers. Okay. So here's a model that a couple of university press folks um, and a couple of librarians developed. And we eventually kind of started, brought um, uh, John Lanahan from JSTOR into the conversation. And it's, it's, it's like I said, it's really mirrored on this idea of um, two things. One, the NEH model, um, which is a very, uh, I think they just do like maybe a hundred of these books a year. Ours was built for scale. We, we had this notion that um, the thing that's been missing with open access is scale. And that if you get a, enough participants into the, the, the business model, that you can actually have numbers that become, become practical after a while. So the main idea here is that there's, uh, for three years, there, if you're a university press, you can sell print and you can sell essentially like Kindle editions and things for iPads and whatnot, but all the institutional sales will go through a single um, collection and libraries will be encouraged to purchase that collection because one, it will give their patrons access to that collection, which is what libraries like to do. They like to buy things and get things for buying them. But they're also supporting the greater good because after three years, these books become open. And what we have found is that there are some librarians who like to spend their dollars. They want something, they need accountability. They want something in return. They're not just giving money away, but they also like doing things for the greater good. And so the idea is like, can we, can we pitch this to libraries that not only are you getting um, uh, very liberal usage terms for uh, books in the collection, but you're also eventually going to help um, spread the word on these books and make them available um, throughout the world. We've been doing some very primitive modeling. I just made these numbers up. John Lenahan, is, the JSTOR is likely to be a vendor that's going to help us do this. He does not endorse these like we made these up. They're going to figure out later what it is. This is for the sake of conversation, right? So is, is $5,000 what presses need to make a book open after three years? Um, is $7,500 to $15,000 the amount of money that a library would pay for a collection of 300 books to get, you know, pretty liberal usage terms and support them uh, ultimately being open? What is what all these numbers look like when you scale them? What if you're talking about 2,000 monographs instead of 300 monographs? So um, again, these are numbers just to provoke conversation. And it, it also completely understates all the added expenses about preservation and a whole bunch of things that we're just completely ignoring just for the sake of the conversation. So this is the quick summary here um, for a press. You get financial security. Um, you know you're gonna you're, you're guaranteed the, the stipend. A lot of uh, OA programs are these kind of flip to open where if enough libraries like it, then maybe it becomes open and super kind of hedgy. You just don't know if it's gonna happen. This program would be guaranteeing it. Um, you know you're gonna get this eventual, this long-term um, usage of uh, the, the OA usage that I've shown on, on that other chart. And it also might um, make you stop worrying so much about uh, the, the, the marketplace driving publishing decisions, which presses kind of say they don't do, but they have to do because they are responsible for their own budget. So we, so we cannot publish as much as we want to, especially in marginalized fields where there's not necessarily a strong marketplace. And this may um, upend that. For libraries, you get a really good value. You get liberal usage terms on these books. Um, it is simplifying um, kind of a growingly complex OA landscape where there are lots of individual presses coming to libraries and say, hey, will you do this for our collection? There's 140, 100, I don't know, Peter, how many AU presses members? 140? 159. Yeah, so if 159 AU presses come to libraries and pitch an OA program, the libraries are gonna like barricade the doors and say, stop coming. So it's a kind of a one-stop shopping. Um, and we think it just it supports every bit of the humanities landscape, the publishers, the authors, the readers. And, and then there's a million problems with this, right? So this is like a crazy idea. So um, at most presses, 5,000 is not enough. Like the tome of subsidy, uh, which is kind of a precedent for this, is $15,000. Um, a lot of presses have told us 75 sounds better than 5,000, which makes sense. Um, do libraries like this idea? I don't know. I'm a publisher. I'm not a librarian. And then, um, you know, are there other places that may want to chip in here? Like, are we only talking about libraries supporting this? Like, would an author's home institution put some money in to make their book open? Would a scholarly association, would something, you know, would there be a society that might support it? Um, are there foundations that might want to throw money at that? Okay, that is the super sprint job. So I, I'm assuming these slides are all going to be available. They're actually probably on the site now, so you can go through. And we can go through, uh, and as we have a conversation, go through them. And I'm going to leave them up for my colleagues here. And Pooja, I think we want to start with Sharla online, um, and then we will switch to uh, to the local crowd here. So can I? Do you guys want to sit up here? I think, you want to go? I think I'm going to stand over the side. And I think when we do questions at the end, maybe the three of us should sit up there so that everyone can answer. Okay. 
So we want to get our folks in here. I'm just going to get Sharla visible. Sharla, why don't you go ahead and start presenting and I'll get your uh, face on the screen for us here. Okay, so I will appear to talk into nothingness. It's it's so awkward and in these virtual. So actually, I'm very um um very pleased that you offered the hybrid uh, option. The at last minute, I had to um, present from home, so I I'm grateful for that. So. Uh, First of all, my name is Sharla. I'm the senior strategist of open access and scholarly communication initiatives at Lyricist, which is a nonprofit membership organization based in the US that serves libraries, museums, and archives. And just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm particularly interested in better understanding the dynamics around making scholarly publishing more sustainable through explorations in community building, open access publishing, and building more equitable and inclusive revenue models. And so that's why I'm, I'm I'm part of this crew around this particular model that I, and I'm, I'm very excited about it. Um, my traditional role at Lyricist is like many other consortia, I negotiate best pricing and licensing terms for products and services available to our members. But in the last many years, um, I've been tasked with building um, a hub of, of in particular non-APC-based open access programs for um, books, journals, and uh, infrastructure to give a place for libraries to go to find those programs and be able to invest in them. So those first way and second way programs have um, largely been uh, participating in those and learning a lot from them of what's working and what has not. Um, and so I manage a diverse portfolio of, of vendor and publisher relationships in my work at Lyricist, but I'm particularly focused on um, forming relationships with organizations that support nonprofit mission driven publishing. So I work with a lot of university presses and very proud to do so. Um, so John asked us as the panel to provide challenges, um, you know, to talk about, you know, what what are we worried about with this model um, and what opportunities might be out there? So strengths and weaknesses, I like to take the challenge and opportunity approach. Um, and so for me, I have three challenges that I'm, I'm going to bring up. The first one is, and you're all thinking, not enough libraries showing up. Those were big numbers, uh, 300, 500. Um, I've yet to administer a program where I've seen that many show up. However, I'm not JSTOR. Um, um, and they uh, having them as part of this can can help with that. Uh, but the, the big challenges that even JSTOR is thinking about is one, it takes a long time for libraries to create ongoing spend lines in their budgets. Um, most of these OA programs and like this one are new. And so they have to create a new line. And for ongoing lines in particular, those new subscription type models, those are more difficult. Um, and so there's an opportunity here where this model could potentially provide um, opportunities for libraries to commit to multiple year agreements. And since this is based on a three year embargo, um, maybe have a three year commitment that the libraries pay and they can even pay that full amount, the three year amount up front. Um, and then that gives them that time to evaluate whether it's a good return on investment and so that they can um, build in that budget line uh, over time as well if they do see it as a good ROI. Libraries still have concerns about investing in open access and it's still positioned as experimental in a lot of ways and so getting libraries to invest in something uh, brand new that's also open access, um, it's creating an opportunity uh, or uh, that maybe this program can create a ways to connect new ways to connect all stakeholders in the entire ecosystem through one-on-one -on -one conversations and education broad, more broadly about books, book publishing, and the library and university press communities to help combat some of those challenges. The second challenge is assessing value. The use of the book is still not well understood, and particularly a paywalled environment, but let alone in open access. You see those numbers. What does that even mean uh, with the small numbers and the big numbers? Um, the life of the book is also, it's much longer than the life of a journal article. Re so reaching peak levels of use takes longer. Reaching peak levels of citations takes longer. And those numbers are fuzzy. Um, how do those numbers show impact in not only research, but also teaching and learning? And there are a few very legitimate measures for quality of use. How is it being used other than just being clicked on? Um, so finally, the usage and met the other metrics we use to measure impact are built off of paywalled content, which mostly only measures local impact. But disciplines are not local. 
scholarship is not local. And even in a paywalled environment, usage isn't local. When you look at the aggregate usage, which typically only the publisher knows, so long as, so long as they can actually capture all of the usage from the various platforms upon which their titles can be accessed and then normalizing that data across. So because resources are limited in the money that libraries spend, is not their money. They have to have evidence that shows a good return on investment of the funds they steward. So I'm concerned that many libraries will look at their own local usage only in those first three years um, and use that as a, as a proxy for whether or not they want to continue for the long term. So there's an opportunity here, though, for this program to innovate um, the capture and the interpretation of metrics and measurements of impact by working collaboratively collaboratively with the publishers and the community of publishers that form around this, as well as the participating libraries and, and those metric related partners that we know of in the in the industry. So I'm, I'm very excited about that, perhaps books leading the way in innovating metrics. And then the last challenge, um, our principles and values misalignment. The definition of what is good and ethical in scholarly publishing, and particularly what is good and ethical in open access publishing, is constantly in flux. And as a community, we have not yet landed on what that is, because not all publishers or libraries have had the opportunity to engage in open across all disciplines and content types. We can only learn through participation. So for now, definitions of what is good or ethical are predominantly coming from funding agencies and bodies like Coalition S or UKRI, and now by way of the White House Office of Science and Technology. Um, and immediate OA is becoming a proxy for good OA. So that, that's, a, that's a concern when you have, are implementing a new program with a three-year embargo and not immediate open access. Libraries and funders are pushing for immediate OA, particularly in journal publishing, and that is trickling over to expectations around book publishing as well. Other book publishers, those that are native OA publishers, are doing this in particular. And why isn't this program too? How do we square that principle of, you know, of this immediate OA with the principle of sustainability? I think this can be done through an another key principle, which is transparency. Transparency of how money is flowing, revealing the cost of infrastructures and labor and how the funds flow through the program are helping to sustain the publisher's operations. That needs to be incredibly transparent to those who are investing in it. Transparency of the challenges that all stakeholders, libraries and publishers are facing. Uh, and then transparency of progress toward the goals of the program. What are the funding gaps? What are the participation gaps and publishers as well as potential library customers. What isn't working and how can the stakeholders work together to improve the program? And for me, an opportunity in this program is to develop actually a governance structure around it so that they can establish principles and values to guide decision making and be better engaged with the community that forms around it. So that, that's for me. Thank you. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, it's okay. Right. You're going to speak up. Right. Is it on set at the podium? It's set. You don't need slides, right? No, I don't need slides. Yeah, I'll you talk and I'll take care of okay. that. Just my green shirt. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, feels that was a great presentation around DEI, and then we're following a panel with two white guys named John. So sorry, kind of switching, uh, not the way we wanted to do it necessarily, but um, it is what it is. So uh, I'll continue here. Um, I think that the, the, the part that's important to look at, I'm, and I'm representing JSTOR uh, at, this, at this juncture around it from providing access to the content and having the business model. And I think that's important about it is like, does it matter to make content freely available? Does it matter that uh, in populations around the world that we provide access to scholarship? Do we care about it as individuals? Do we care about it as institutions? And I think we have to ask ourselves that. And if so, what's a viable model to help us get there? When, uh, and this ages me here, so not only John, but in white, but old. So going back 20 years, um, before I was teaching in psychology and child psychology uh, at the college in California, um, and then about 20 years ago, really looking at, there's a lot of information that's missing in scholarship to, and how we teach. And we started a company 20 years ago um, 
called Ethnic News Watch and Gender Watch and Alt Press Watch. And these were taking stuff in CDs and then started to make them online to where you got what was called at the time, the other side of the story. So, and what was important is when I started to bring that content into lectures in college, you started to notice that you would take one view of a particular ethnic group that might have had a negative impact on something according to the Los Angeles Times in LA from, from Southern California originally. And then you actually get the ethnic newspaper and you get the view of it and it's completely contrasts and different. But if you don't bring those views together and make knowledge and awareness of it accessible to people, they don't know how to think about that. They don't know that there's another view. So that leads us to this over 20 years of being involved in electronic resources and being at JSTOR for 10 years. When we started to build out open access eBooks in 2016, what we heard from libraries is that it was critical and important to understand the library workflow, meaning the MARC records, discovery service, how it incorporates into e-resource. So we needed to make sure it wasn't an open access in the cheapest way it could be done, and it sits outside of your workflows and you hope somebody finds it. Open access books should have the same value and incorporated in the same way as a licensed book. And that was critical. Happened in 2016. We feel it's the same critical thing that we do here with this model. So we feel that we can replicate what we've seen with successes at this point. The challenges though, are we going to get this 300 books? It's a small number of books to start. Uh, how do we know what quality of the books that we're going to get? Are they going to get books? Are they going to be books that the libraries initially are going to want to pay for and fund? And once those books then are funded and made available, are we going to see use of those books when they are made open access to users across the world? John showed a slide earlier, and that actually is a little different. Um, sorry, John, but I'm going to correct you just a little bit. It wasn't um, based on 2020 data where we just opened up a bunch of books in 2020 and had usage. These were books, some cases really old, 15 years old, 20 years old. They were books that publishers and we had, we at JSTOR and me in particular kept going to publishers saying, you're not generating revenue anymore from these books. They, they, you're, they're, you can see there's no sales. You're not getting sales even outside of JSTOR and they're not getting used. So let, let's see about just opening them up and see if it provides a new value to these books. So what that slide was showing was looking at one, uh, actually, let me rephrase that. That was looking at all of the usage before the book turned open and one to two years of usage after the book turned open. As soon as it was open, it was used by users across the world at various institutions because they're already on JSTOR or they're, going, they're already on Google and they're looking for information and scholarly content, and now they're finding it and they're getting access to it, but they don't, if it's to 200 institutions of publishers selling their ebook to to generate revenue, and that's where it stands. And the rest of these users around the world don't have access to the content, make it available, they use it. So can we get quality content from the publishers to put into this model? And if so, are the libraries gonna be willing to fund it? Do they feel that they want to be able to support an open access initiative, that they give immediate access to their faculty and students to support the long-term equity of access to that content to users around the world. Uh, I feel strongly that we'll get there, um, but it really then depends on whether the library structure and funding is capable of funding that at the price points we put in. We wanna publish this and come out as a pilot, learn from it, learn from all of you, hopefully today and then along the way, to find out it's probably not going to be perfect to start um, and we're going to need to make adjustments, but we're going to be open to that. So we have something that's sustainable, not only for today, for those who fund it, but for tomorrow, for those who want to access it. So uh, I'll turn it over. I think that's it for me. Yeah. I don't need this one. Okay, that's off. Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Croucher. I'm the executive director of the Triangle Research Libraries Network. That's a consortium of the libraries at the University of North Carolina, Duke University, North Carolina State University, and North Carolina Central. So we're all within about 30 miles of each other um, in North Carolina. 
our consortium started basically in the 20s and 30s with Duke and UNC collaborating on their print collections. NC State joined the consortium in the 50s and North Carolina Central joined in the 90s. Three of those institutions are historically white, one is historically black. Um, we really were founded on the idea of sharing print collections. That's what Duke and UNC especially did for decades. Um, and you can see the success of that collaboration. The study was done, I mean, at this point, it's probably been 10 years ago, but of all of the print titles held across all four of our institutions, 70% of those titles are held by only one institution. So basically, they're not duplicating in their acquisitions of print and, and haven't been for a long time. Only 3% of all titles are held by all four institutions. So this is kind of what we do. Um, I, I had some comments I wanted to make, but hearing the other comments, I, I, I've changed a little bit. One of the things that I was struck by both Sharla and John's presentations, um, actually both of the Johns, the Johns's presentation is this idea of the public good and what we do as academic libraries. Our consortium right now has been actively engaged in an open source project called Project Reshare, um, which is for basically resource sharing among institutions. Um, there are bit three or four consortia in the country have already launched ReShare. When we first started looking at this project about five years ago, I mean, we were sort of one of the initial foundational groups in the development of this. We thought it would be much cheaper than the tool we were currently using for resource sharing, which was called Relay D2D. Relay was a company, the Canada-based company that was purchased by OCLC. So basically it was an OCLC company called a product called D2D that we had been using. And when we started looking at this new product called ReShare product slash project called ReShare, we thought it would be much more economical. We were looking at it initially to save money. And when we looked at the numbers four or five years ago, it was clear that switching from the OCLC product to this open source product would save us money. Turns out that's not the case, <laughs> as it often is not when you're looking at open source things. It's not about saving money. So that's one of the things I, I was listening to. It's about you know, participating in the public good, um, you, you know, making sure that people all over the world have access to materials. So I think one of the challenges um, that we have with this kind of project is just repeating that message that it's not necessarily about saving money. That's, you know, we're not necessarily, we're not in the business of saving money. That's not what we do. That's not what universities do. That's what corporations do, but we're universities. Um, and we need to be thinking of it, of it that way. Um, we, TRLN in 2010, it was before I, I started there, but we participated in a pilot with Oxford University Press where our consortium got one print copy of all of their scholarship, the Oxford University Press scholarship, one print copy that we could share among our institutions. And then we all had collective access to all of the, the digital titles on the University Press scholarship online. Again, it didn't save us money. <laughs> um, we probably ended up spending the same amount of money we would have had we purchased like multiple copies of all those titles. Um, so I guess that's one, one, one of the challenges is making sure that I think it's kind of a marketing issue. Um, and, and we, you notice two of the universities I mentioned have university presses, Duke and UNC. So, so we're really in a position to do something creative with this. And I, I looked back, John presented to our four university librarians on this project. It was a year ago, it was October 8th, 2021. So it was almost exactly a year ago. And everybody said, oh yeah, that's great. Yeah, sounds interesting. But then we didn't really take it anywhere next. So I'm sort of, I'm, I'm re-energized by being here and hearing this conversation um, and thinking about how to put this forth to, to our leadership. Um, we also have another challenge in our particular case. The people who John spoke to a year ago, those four university librarians, 
Two of them have departed and we have two new university librarians. So that's a challenge and an opportunity, but, but with this transition leadership, it's time to put something like this in front of them. Um, because I think it does it does make sense for, for, for our consortium in particular, and I think other academic libraries as well. Uh, let's see if I got... Oh, also Charlotte, one thing Charlotte said about this is an opportunity to create a governance structure. I've seen that happen with, with reshare, which, which I mentioned, which really is not really directly related to collections, um, but it is just a model of how we have built this open source community together and built the governance structure together. And it's been kind of messy and it's taken a while, um, but I think what's coming out of it is definitely worth the time and money and effort. So that's it for me. And then um, get Charlotte back up on the screen. And then we, we want to have a conversation. Um, this is really I'm just curious what people think about it, what they like, what they don't like about it. Um, I don't know if there are publishers and libraries in the room who may have very specific thoughts, but uh, really we just have a dialogue. So, so please. I guess, well, maybe you would have no idea how to answer our question, but um, do you see any potential uh, for use of this with commercial scholarly publishers? Because I would say I think of us the same way as, or as similar to UPs in most ways, but obviously there's a different, a very different financial component. I'm not in a position to make any decisions anyway, I'm just an editor, but um, do you see potential for that in the same kind of uh, yeah, I mean, this, this question has come up, and I guess the thing I would say about it is this is a business model where I'm going to copyright it. Like anybody can do this, right? Because I guess we stole this from NEH, so it's already violating um, uh, copyright. Um, I actually would like to hear from John in particular about that because to me, it's kind of like it's, there's a product being sold here. And the, the integrity of the product and the boundaries around that I think have, have meaning. Um, and I will just be super obnoxious and say that as a first press person, like I would be really cautious about non first presses uh, being in like the one that I want to be in for my press. I'm not saying that we wouldn't consider being in anything, but um, we're just we're super obnoxious that way. But I also think that might be how libraries think about it as well. So, uh, I'll comment on that too. But I think. I would start with just saying, yes, uh, I, I don't see a reason why commercial publishers wouldn't participate, because if I didn't say that, I'd sound like a hypocrite that you want to make all our content available to all users. That would seem very hypocritical than if we're trying to really limit the content we're talking about when we say it. However, we got to look at it. There's first pressing need, and it's the sustainability of the university presses. It's the bibliodiversity that they're concerned about, that they don't feel they have a good model to be able to publish in particular subject areas, to focus in publications and content in around DEI, um, because they don't know how many copies they're going to sell. So they're trying to focus on more popular areas. I don't think the commercial presses have as many of those initial concerns. So I think we start with where we know the biggest challenge is. If it's successful, then I would think it's open to any publisher to be able to join with a goal that we want to get access to as many people as possible. Yeah, and I think that the mindset, at least for me, maybe not for the people in charge, would be in terms of increasing accessibility, not in terms of like, would this somehow make us more money? Um, but then again, I can't uh, necessarily speak for other people. Yeah, and the interesting thing about that too, about money, is that um, <laughs> uh, it, it's that, you know, it's it's set in the beginning because it's, it's the model that we know. We're, oh, we're selling, access to academic institutions to generate a particular amount of money that cover costs is all not-for-profit organizations. Commercial obviously would be different, but there's that. We still have costs, commercial, not-for-profit, doesn't matter. Um, but what we don't know is what happens and what are the other future business models that occur when you have a book that's available to 200 users and that's it, and that's really all who knows about that book unless it gets cited and then people learn more about it, and interlibrary and they get access, blah, blah, blah. But all of a sudden, you have something that's so accessible and used around the world in scholarship, increases of, of citations, 
maybe more demand for print and people still want print or they want their own copy without limitations that might occur on what's available on a particular platform. What is that opportunity? And then is there revenue, not so much where, um, what it is to get access to the book, but revenue that happens once access is there and there's demand, then what? And I don't think we have answers for it yet, but it's something I think could explore opportunities for future revenue uh, for publishers and their sustainability. Um, so we'll take some questions in the room and I'll bring the mic around just to ensure that our online audience also hears it. So just be patient, we'll try that. Here, number one. Hi, I have two, uh, two questions related. Um, the embargo, uh, first of all, thanks for doing this and for sharing this in this forum. This is fantastic. Uh, I'm a uh, director of a university press in Singapore, a uh, market that's two orders of magnitude smaller than the US. <laughs> so the pressures that you're talking about are you know, even more intense for us. We're very active in experimenting with open access and different models. But um, the embargo period looks like a great out, but of course, I'm seeing so much of a shift in library buying to demand driven, you know, buying at point of use uh, as opposed to buying when the book is new. I just wonder how these two things interact. And then also, could you, uh, I'd be very happy to share notes. Maybe this isn't quite the forum, but it's a little sharper on the learnings from knowledge and net unlatch because we still have that gap to bridge between uh, presenting the material to the libraries and getting the library commitment. Katie has taken one way of doing it. It's worked up to a point, but I'm very curious on the different perspectives. Yeah. Um, Sharma also might have some yeah. response to Charlotte, that. Charlotte, do you want to turn in there? Yeah, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know yeah. What, what she sees or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm. I still didn't necessarily hear everything. Although I, I do. We need to be careful about whenever you're looking at just the local level and um, how a library is assessing value. Uh, there are so many subdisciplines out there that the, the maybe every expert in the world has read that book, and it might be you know 25. Um, and one of those is at your institution and you see that as low usage and you then say that's a that doesn't have high value. Um, and that, that's kind of the problem with the paywall. Uh, it, it doesn't the paywall model doesn't just put a wall around access. It puts a wall around everything. You don't understand the full community that is engaging in that work um, at, at the local level at, or at the global level. Um, you, you don't understand why they're accessing that title. And so, you know, DDA models, you know, demand-driven models are, are, are to solve a, a particular problem for libraries that can't buy everything. Libraries have never been able to buy everything. That's why consortia exist um, for like, you know, like Lisa was saying around the shared collection. We, we need to rethink what does open access mean? In my mind, it's that we are building a globally shared collection. And who can fill in the funding gaps to be able to make sure that everything is made open? And this program can maybe provide that, it, that there are, there are some that have, that see local value for some of those titles, but there may be those libraries who invest in it because they want them to be open, not necessarily just because they need it at a local level. Uh, there are different levels of agency at institutions as to whether, how they can spend that money and why. And so I think if we can just expose everyone that is participating in it um, through that transparency and seeing where there might be funding gaps or who might or might not be participating could help solve that. And then those who need it immediately um, will, will buy it immediately in that way. And this isn't the model. This is a model. So I think Knowledge and Latch still has a place for certain titles. I think the Opening the Future models has a place for certain titles. And this is just filling one of those gaps for the, the publishers and the library community that need to get access to other kinds of titles that may not, those other models may not fit. I just want to add one comment about Knowledge and Latch, which is we participated at UNC, and I think it's very innovative. And it's been it's been one of the things that's validated the idea about usage going you know exponentially and that all those terms are kind of crowd um but um but my understanding of the knowledge and lounge is that it not only does it not scale well it actually doesn't scale at all which is if too many people participate in it the library's like whoa we, we we don't have that much money right we have a certain amount of money. so we deliberately built this program to think about 
that sale because we wanted it to feel transformational um, rather than kind of nibbling around the edges of a lot of open. There's also a lot of precarity. It's, you know, you're talking off like your book might be open if enough libraries are you okay with that? Yes, no. And then, yes, oh, well, no, 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 you weren't interested in it. Sorry. Ignore that earlier conversation. That is a bad conversation to have. And so we wanted to just eliminate all those steps. And the, I don't know how complex it is on the library side, but I forgot a sense that it was it's easy. So we, we, we meant to simplify something. We have a question. Okay, just, just real fast. Oh, yeah. one, one other very quick comment. Because in demand driven acquisition, what, what the learnings from that, I think, what, what feel, have me feel optimistic about this particular model in that when library selectors, subject selectors would go, oh, there's back with the course readings, courses in there, and they're selecting through that process of books that then they're going to purchase at the library and make available to the user. And that's what the users know, and that's available to them. When, when at JSTOR, we implemented a demand-driven evidence-based evaluation, what changed was that libraries who felt, well, if it was important, we would have purchased it already. But then when you make the content available, it wasn't so much just a value proposition, I agree with Shara, but it was also, wow, there's a demand for content we didn't even know existed here from our users, and it changed the optimism around the librarian and how they select content. And I'll remember one conversation with Harold Paulson, he's a, over at University of California, San Diego. He said, we had no, there was a faculty member in Renaissance who said, wow, we'll never use an ebook. Where it's, I mean, how can you use an ebook? You've got to have paper, big copy of textbook. And, and then all of a sudden he found an article, I'm sorry, a book chapter relevant to a journal article in the area of Renaissance and it changed going, wow, I would have never found this otherwise. I never even knew that there was something relevant in this book and this chapter towards this topic area. So my hope is if we're publishing in the right subject areas and we're in the right, which we're trying to do here with these titles, that they get used because they're exposed to the users who engage with them on those particular topic areas, like we saw with the manner. Thanks so much for this presentation and talking about this um, exciting model that makes books available to so many more people around the world. Um, I was wondering to what extent um, other types of open access, like digital web readings, might come into the conversation. Um, I'm thinking about you know, si signing up to get in the queue for uh, you know, an audio book on my local public library account or uh, being able to download one or two chapters uh, from a Smithsonian uh, library book as opposed to the whole thing. Um, this is not enough. Um, like having the whole thing downloaded on my computer. <laughs> um, so yeah, just what other what other types of uh, lending or um, uh, types of restrictions that may or may not be too intrusive might uh, come into the conversation? Well, I. I I actually think you're kind of pointing to one of the weaknesses of this program, which is um, if you are a patron of a participating library, then you're in really good shape. And if you're not, then for three years, you're, you're pretty much out in the cold. And, and we're potentially actually limiting the choices of libraries. It could be that the only way to get an ebook of one of the books in this collection is to have to subscribe to the whole collection, which is a big bundle that everybody curses about, um, whether you're talking about cable TV or elsewhere. So, um, that that's a that is a fundamental weakness of the, the, the program is that in some ways we are um, in the long game we're doing great and in the short game we're doing worse uh, in terms of um, options and things like that. I will say the the usage terms that we're imagining in the collection are going to be much more liberal than I mean you know once once it's in the collection your library has it then you're talking about basically unlimited usage and not. And, Controls um, there. I don't quite know how TRLN would, would work. I have to have a quick on that through. Do they have to have a conversation? Yeah, because if, 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 we, oh, if we purchased a collection as a consortium, could a Duke student borrow the same book that you have used? So that, 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 this has become a problem, a challenge for consortia is what. As I mentioned, what we were found sharing print books, and our universities are very close to each other, and books go on van, and 
you know, you can request it one morning and get it that afternoon, you would see. So it's that print system was working pretty well. And now that so many books are published digitally only, um, we can't lend those books throughout the consortium like we used to be able to do. Um, we are looking at controlled digital lending of, of print books, which the CDL will kind of It's basically this uh, approach to lending print books that would, would enable someone like a UNC library could digitize. If a Duke student requests a UNC book, the UNC librarian takes that print book off the shelf, digitizes it, keeps the print book off the shelf, sends the digital copy to the Duke student. The Duke student uses it. That digital copy access ends, and then UNC puts the print book back on the shelf. So it's really a, the same one-to-one -one lending you have in a print book. Um, so I don't know how relevant that is, but we do need to be thinking about digital lending in this context. If you put us a question back to me for a moment, in, in the scenario that you raised, would, if there was an easy way to get the interlibrary loan to at the chapter or at the local level, I, I know you've mentioned audiobooks or so, but just speaking to, to the starting monographs for a moment, would that be sufficient? You'd be like, well, I know as an individual from a non-affiliated institution, there's something that I know I want to have access to. And one of the other institutions can easily make that available to me through an ILL process. Would that be sufficient? already and we did a collaboration with your public library on um, Schomburg uh, reading list and one of the key things was there are 95 books part of that reading list that reference a lot of other content but you can't get to that other content so you're, you're like well how do I really dive into this and really understand the experience and, and the knowledge there and so what we were able to do is work with publishers at the journal article and both chapter level find relevant articles and chapters to make them openly and freely available and supporting the collaboration your public library, the Schomburg reading list. So there are those options at the chapter level and article level where we're seeing more and more of those becoming freely available and easily accessible to individuals. So I think you're starting to see that trend occur as well. All right, we've got two more questions, one here in the room and then one that I'll field online. It's Pajai, Peter Mercury from the Association of University Press. It's just a real quick uh, suggestion comment. Um, picking up on the, John's response uh, to the first question about uh, expanding uh, the program to non-university presses and your uh, expression uh, about, of the sort of the incrementer that comes with being a university press and also picking up on Lisa's uh, non-verbal uh, endorsement uh, uh, of that imprimatur. Um, I'd like to encourage you all not to use the word quality when you're referring to um, uh, will university presses contribute books that collections librarians will want to acquire. The I don't think the quality of the books is what's in question. It's the desirability, the marketability, the appeal, but the books come with an assumption of quality. That's such a great well put, Peter. And uh, we sometimes use that as a shorthand that we don't go. We sort of joke, like, you know, are we going to put the best books in the collection? And of course, the true joke behind that is that 
I always tell people I, my business model is one third of my folks will support the other two thirds. I just don't know the end year which third it's going to be. Like, I don't know where the best folks are going to be. I don't know what the success is going to be. But that's a really good point is that every book is worthy of, of being potentially included. Um, and actually, it's one of the questions about, you know, is there a type of book that is optimized for this type of program uh, versus, you know, what that might not be? And I don't know whether that's a, a market driven question or a usage question. But I think what's exciting about this is we've learned so much from a very small data set so far. And I think once we do this, and we're talking about hundreds of open monographs being used, and I think publishers can start making better decisions about how to publish and, and whether this is the right program for a certain type of person. Thanks, David. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the yeah, you've got a mic. Is that a question? Put it together. I don't know if in person before switching on. Um, John, this is, I'm just wondering, like, what is the status of, of this? I mean, I, I heard you talk about a year ago yeah. or some today, but kind of what's, how close is this to actually happening? And what's your kind of process right now? That's the question. <laughs> um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to know very soon um, what we're looking at doing that this, this provides uh, a need for upfront funding um, to be able to allow this to be successful without knowing or not, or not if libraries are going to fund it because publishers can be expected to put content in and then see nothing coming back from it so what we're in the process of doing is securing the funding um, which I think we're very close to. And John kind of put some numbers. It's going to take a few million dollars of upfront funding to make sure that this can get started and really, and knowing there's a risk that it may not be successful as a pilot at the end of three years. Um, so our hope is that it's finalized uh, before the end of this month. And we get a chance to talk about this a little bit more also at Charleston, understand from the library's perspective does this make sense to you? Do you want to participate in something like this? And if we keep hearing yeses, then I feel very strongly it's something that we see really come uh, to be a reality uh, at some point uh, next year. So our final question is from the online community, uh, simply asking, where can I get more information about this program? And are you looking for more participating presses? So, um... And I shouldn't have just flipped it to John somehow literally. Um, we have we've done some informal um, inquiries within the university press um, uh, landscape to just kind of just test the the you know no you're crazy go away yeah here are all my books and somewhere in between and it's the last one most people are um, but there's a number of people in the people don't have to write back when you're crazy go away they just ignore you. Um, but there's a, there's a good number of people in the, yeah, like, like sign us up, like we're ready to essentially do this. Um, and so, um, there is not like a place, uh, to like go sign up or even to learn more. And we are, um, behind on the governance aspect of this. We acknowledge that and, and we're, we actually have a plan to try and build kind of a center of gravity where, where there is a resource for information. Um, but if you are a university press, um, what's likely to happen is if I think, think if, if JSTOR wants to model this out, is that John will probably be offering arrangements that every university press that you all deal with, um, kind of a writer on existing contracts or something like that. So there'll be something probably an engagement with, with very likely to be JSTOR. Um, that said, anybody can do this. <laughs> you can start, you build a platform right now and build a cash register and go, go talk to presses. Like there's nothing stopping anybody else. Uh, from doing this. Um, so, uh, uh, so yeah, so you will hear from JSTOR is, is my guess, is the word that is. And is, is JSTOR also reaching out to the libraries or does that come after you get more momentum for presses? Um, we feel that the momentum seems pretty positive so far. I mean, you know, from what I know we've gathered for the presses, I, the good thing is it feels like we're in a scenario where we're going to have well over 300 titles that will probably want to be contributed. And then it's going to be, well, how do we select the 300 that we can start with? Um, we've been talking to libraries and, and I think we'll continue to talk to libraries. The first thing is to then 
uh, get an addendum to existing publisher agreements to participate in this program with clarity around what the selection process and participation means. Uh, and once that's secured, then it would then be also having the agreements with the academic institutions to then know what the terms would be for their participation. And all of that we would be expecting with the publisher side sooner than the institution because they need to know, well, they're already released in 2023 books and catalogs. They're already working with other avenues where they're publishing that. So we need to let them know sooner rather than later. Then when we have the content and we start working with the academic institutions, give them a start date, and then let them know when they'll have access to that content. But that all is publisher first, know that we actually have the content, um, academic institutions, make sure they're willing to do it. And then we're like, okay, now we have the one case. So. Well, all right. It's been a very inspiring and nourishing morning of uh, presentations. And we thank you all for your participation, both here in the room at GW and online, wherever you are.